Okay, we're recording now. So Dr. VJ, he will be our first speaker today. He has extensive experience working as a psychosocial therapist and an educator at the University of Sydney. He's currently working in Australia. He's made some incredible complimentary accomplishments in the field, um, sharing a strong passion for sexual health promotion. We also have Dr. Margaret Redelman, who has an absolute wealth of experience working clinically and in research as a medical sexologist. Um, so welcome, Dr. Vijay and Dr. Margaret. It's our absolute pleasure to have you here with us uh, leading today's session. So what I'm going to do is hand over to you uh, Vijay, and I'll allow you to introduce yourself a bit more thoroughly. Thank you. Let me. All right. So maybe you can see my screen, yeah? We can see your screen well. All right. So thank you, Mary, for inviting uh, me to give this uh, a webinar and in your introduction you said psychosocial therapist. I'm a psychosexual therapist. So today's is all about uh, uh, sex. Uh, so what I'll be doing is giving an overview and then I will leave it to uh, Dr. Margaret Riddleman, a well-known colleague of mine for more than a decade now to actually talk about uh, sexual dysfunctions and functioning within <clears throat> arthritis. So uh, today I'm joining you all from the Daru country and I would like to uh, uh, pay my acknowledgement to elders past, present and anyone in this Zoom room today. This was a photo taken before all the interest rates went high. So I had a bit more uh, hair and cherish on my face. I have 14 years of uh, practitioner and academic experience, and I continue to work as a psychosexual therapist and educator. These are my affiliations, and I declared no conflict of interest in doing this presentation. Right, so I want to say, <clears throat> Usually my presentations are for health professionals and students, so I don't do much for the community. So I have to really tone down my uh, presentation slides and the messages to suit to the community. Uh, I don't know how many of you will be willing to answer questions. And if you don't want to, that's fine. But it's important to at least look at those questions and try to answer to yourself. And this is very important because without understanding what is this whole thing called sexuality, without understanding what we really mean by sex, without really understanding what is sexual function, it's very hard to actually uh, move on and, and trying to achieve something or trying to fix something without even knowing what is broken in the first place. And in my clinical experience, I've had so many people approaching for help, thinking they have something abnormal. And in many cases, it's sad to see that they don't have anything abnormal. They just did not know what is normal. And when you don't know what is normal, and the topic is very taboo, and it's not well spoken or discussed, then it makes a person to start thinking that whatever they are experiencing is only one, they are the only one to experience it. And it's a bigger problem when in fact it's not. So that's why I'm going to spend another 10, 15 minutes quickly to, to give an overview and then we'll move on. So my first question, what is sexuality? Is there anyone in the group who wants to give it a go? What is this thing called sexuality? Although I can see names, I'm not going to call out names. That will be too much. But anyone, any volunteers? Could it include sexual orientation? Mm -hmm. Okay. Part of it. Anything else? And the rule is if there is silence for more than seven seconds, I'll keep moving on, otherwise we'll be sitting on forever. So first and foremost, sexuality is not equal to sex. Some people think sex is a shortened form of sexuality, when in fact it's not. Now I'm giving you a caution here. 
in the next couple of slides, you'll be seeing this symbol re repeatedly. When you see this not equal to symbol, you need caution how to read that. It means sexuality does not mean sex, but it includes sex. Okay, so that's how you need to read that symbol. It's not like if they're not totally different or anything, it involves, but it's not all about sexuality. Now, so that's number one equation that sexuality includes many things. Now you're right, Mary, it includes orientation, but sexuality also includes so many other aspects. Now the sex in which it is written here, it's not the act that a lot of us would be thinking of. Sex here is the biological characteristics and gender is the social construct of that biological sex. So those two are separate. Reproduction is something we all knew and it's so long been acknowledged and there's a lot of emphasis on that. So reproduction is separate. And then we have sexual orientation. And then on the bottom, we have the intimacy and eroticism and pleasure. Now, those two, or especially with sexual orientation, those are not well recognized or well discussed in our society with the same level of importance that was given to reproduction. So it's a still hush hush topic and pleasure has never been something you talk to a medical professional or health profession, but they really don't know whom to talk to as well. So things are changing. So the, for example, the World Association has now put out a statement on pleasure. So it's getting due recognition, especially in the last decade or so. So sexuality includes quite a lot of things. The second equation is sex is not equal to performance. Now, once again, as I said before, sex, the act of sex I'm referring here, it includes performance, but it's not about performing to a certain standard or performing to a certain expectation or performing to a certain norm. So it's not a performance, okay? So it's, and, and this is very important. And especially when we get those norms or the standards watching various movies from various sources, we start thinking sex means it has to be to a certain expectation when in fact it doesn't have to be, right? Now, Mary, what is sex then? When we say sex is not equal to performance, what, what is sex then? Anyone else would like to answer that? Oh, if I think of sex, I think intimacy. Mm-hmm, okay. Um, Anything else? By the way, why do people have sex? That's a good question. Right. And you'll be amazed to see how many reasons people have sex. And, but when we don't know that many reasons, and when we are not able to have a clear understanding what sex means to us at this stage in life, then what can, how can we get help for it? How can we fix a problem with it when we really don't know what sex means to us? So it's very important to understand what does sex mean to me at this stage in life? It could have had a different meaning five years ago. It might have a different meaning five years later, but what does sex mean to us at this stage is very important because then when you go to health professionals, sex therapists or medical sexologists, they'll be able to contextualize and help you in a, in a very person-centered way. So sex is not equal to performance, sexual functioning is about the ability to experience sexual pleasure and satisfaction when desired. So it's a very important uh, uh, definition. Now, when we think of sex, it's not always about pleasure for everyone at every time. For some, it's pleasure. For some, it is just a satisfaction. For some, it could be pain. For some, those who have experienced traumatic experience, it's not a pleasant experience. So sexual act or the thought of sexual act could surface 
different emotions to different people at different stages in their life. So that's what sexual functioning is all about. And for those who are interested to know how many reasons are there, so 237 reasons for having sex, <laughs> but largely there are four factors, okay? So physical, emotional, security, and goal attainment. Now, it's not overly old article, but it's about 2007. I'm sure the number of reasons would have increased if we have to repeat the same study now. So we looked at sex is not about performance, includes, but not just about performance. The next equation is performance is not equal to intercourse, right? So what is it then? Any guess? I know you're not going to answer, but it's important to reflect on this question. When we think of the act of sex, a lot of time, the focus is heavily on intercourse, meaning penis inside the vagina in a heterosexual context. It's the penis inside the vagina. That's the thought that strikes a lot of us. But that's not just about intercourse. The performance is a whole suite of actions and we look at it as we go along. Now, we call it as sexual response. That means how the mind and body and the connection between the mind and body, how it responds during different phases of the sexual desire, sexual arousal, and then we go to the climax. So that's, it's like a roller coaster, okay? It doesn't always start high and stay high. It goes up and down, and that's the journey that we are going to talk about. The very, very nice diagram, I, I love this. It's a very old model. It's been criticized, but simplified. You get excited, you reach a plateau, and then you let go of things, so-called orgasm, and then you rest. So that's sort of the linear model, which is popularly to be believed that men are like that. And, but that's not true. Not all men have to go exactly this, okay? Uh, uh, it can be different for different person. And then, from that, the element of desire got added, okay? You need to have the desire in order to be sexual. Now, desire, once again, has three components to it. One is the body, the hormones, the chemical bits. We'll see it in a minute. And then we have the mind, which is the motivation. And then the final bit is the wish, okay? So for someone who's not interested in sex, doesn't mean their hormones are low or there is something wrong with their body. Sometimes you do all the tests, it will be perfectly normal. It's just that they've lost motivation. And for some, they are motivated. There's nothing wrong with their mind, nothing wrong with their body. Their meaning attached to sex has changed. So you need to be very careful when we are talking about desire. Now, this is the circular model, which is quite complex, but to simplify, there's the emotional intimacy, right? You said, Mary, at the beginning about intimacy. So the intimacy and then ropes on to sexual stimulation and then you get aroused. And stereotypically, women are believed to be responding this way and men to be responding in a linear way. I have a different opinion about that. Not all men are linear, not all women are circular, okay? Some women just like sex and they just want to have sex. And not all men always ready for sex. They like to be loved and they like to have the intimacy before they get aroused. So that's, uh, uh, we need to be very uh, mindful of those stereotypical thinking. So the last of the equation, intercourse is not the only way to get pleasure, okay? Intercourse involves pleasure, but it's not just about pleasure. Okay, so uh, uh, there are so many other acts that can also be equally pleasurable, if not even more pleasurable. Then what is the purpose of intercourse? From a very reproductive point of view, yes. And with, before fertility centers, help with fertility were there. If that's the only way of conception, then yes, intercourse is an expectation. But 
if you remove reproduction from the equation, then there are so many other ways to experience pleasure. So that's important to understand. So main sex organ. Now, uh, this is the only picture of a sex organ that I'm going to show. And uh, uh, that's our main sex organ. It might sound very simple and straightforward now after saying that, but in a clinical setting, when I ask my clients, a lot of them, they look for their main sex organ between the thighs and not between their two ears. Is it a problem? Is, that, is it a problem with the client? No, because that's how we've been brought up thinking the main sex organ is the genitalia, when in fact it's the brain that controls the whole body and whole functioning of the body and sexual functioning is no different. Why brain? Brain acts like an accelerator and brake. Accelerator is the excitation and brake is the inhibition. And sometimes, and it's like car, driving a car. You can turn on the engine. If you put pressure on the accelerator, the car and the gear is right, the car moves forward. And if you put on drive and you apply full pressure on the brake, the car doesn't move. And sometimes when it is in equilibrium, the car makes a lot of sound, but there is no movement in the wheel. So it's important to understand that brain, or in fact, the whole body works in an equilibrium, the excitation and inhibition. Now, remember, the chemicals, there are a lot of chemicals in the body in the form of hormones or neurotransmitters. There are different names to it, doesn't matter. Different chemicals in the body. Some works as an accelerator, some works as a brake. This is very important. Now, is there an expectation for you to know all of this? No, but what is important for the consumers, if there is an imbalance in these chemicals, it's going to impact on your sexual functioning. And sometimes when we treat a condition, whether it's a medical or a psychological conditions, that medication could impact on these chemicals, which will then going to impact on your sexual functioning. That's the uh, thing, but a word of caution, if it impacts, it's important not to stop those medications without the health professional's advice, but you can definitely raise your concerns so that they can see whether they can change to a different class or make some adjustment to the dosage. But it's important to treat the primary condition, but it does impact on sexual functioning. So in summary, sexuality is not equal to sex. Sex is not equal to performance. Performance is not equal to intercourse. Intercourse is not equal to pleasure. Therefore, sex is not equal to intercourse. Okay, sex is much more than intercourse, and that involves touch, kiss, hugging, pleasure in different forms, and collectively those are called outer course. And when the male organ and the penis inside the vagina, typically in a heterosexual context, we call that as intercourse. Now one second last slide. The last slide is a treat for all of you. I know it's an evening time. Now, this is exactly what is happening in the community, in the outside world. We are talking everything about desire. We're talking about arousal. There's so much of information in the media, in the movies, in literature. We talk about desire, what Food items increases your desire, or how important is arousal. We portray, we picturize it. And then we talk about all of the inputs. And then on the other hand, we talk about satisfaction and pleasure and performance, but the in-between, we don't do really well. We are letting people go figure it out on their own. Now, how to make sense of this concept? Now you'll be able to understand. On one side, we are showing all the ingredients to make a cake, and then we are showing a beautifully made cake, but without telling which ingredients goes first, which goes second, how to put it in, how long to put it in the oven. We don't tell anything. This is the ingredients, you go figure it out, right? So that is something important to uh, get help 
And yes, with the same ingredients, you need to have some guidance and some handholding on how to uh, uh, take the ingredients to the final product. Okay, so on that note, I will stop sharing and take any questions. And I kept it on 20 minutes time, Mary. Well done. That was very enlightening and really interesting to hear about VJ. I think it's really interesting when it comes to contextual contextualizing sexuality because I didn't realize how many aspects there are in the equation. Mm. So that was uh, really insightful. Does anyone have any questions for VJ? And I'm happy to ask them while you type them in the chat. Mm -hmm. And if it comes, I'll keep answering it, Mary. We'll, we'll go yeah. to uh, Margaret's talk. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Okay, so what we'll do is we'll hand over to uh, Dr. Margaret and we'll come back to any questions because I know I've got a few uh, to fire away shortly. Okay. Okay, hello everyone. Um, I'm a, a, a medical doctor. Uh, I've got a master's in psychotherapy and I've been doing uh, this work for over 40 years now. I love it. Uh, and there's so much I want to share with you. And I get verbal diarrhea and I'll probably run over time. I'm sorry about that, uh, but here we go. So the first thing I want you to think about is that each one of you is a unique individual. Uh, your understanding of sexuality, your experience of sexuality is unique and your experience of arthritis is unique. Uh, your partner is unique and your relationship is unique. So all my presentation, my suggestions are generalizations and potentials for you to think about. And very much I always encourage my patients not to swallow what someone says, no matter how expert they are uh, wholesale. Terry pick what works for you, what's true for you, and customize uh, your experience. So does sex life have to stop when you have arthritis? Well, the simple answer is no. But the chances are that it's going to be different. Uh, it'll take a, a different effort to become aroused uh, or to get, have an orgasm. Uh, the experience may feel differently. And most people would say that that's a bad thing. But in fact, the experience is that when people uh, suffer a catastrophic uh, event in their life or some loss or change that occurs, if you make the effort to educate yourself, to understand the experience and be brave to explore what the boundaries around you are and push on those boundaries, you may discover something that's even better. For example, people who are diagnosed with cancer often have the best years of their life afterwards when they really take life by the horns and enjoy every minute. They don't take it for granted. They really live the experience. So sex after losses can become better, but you have to be brave. So, and don't forget that you are all individuals with those individual backgrounds, but also with maybe a cohort of other medical conditions. So it's not like there's perfection and then you have arthritis. It's arthritis within the constellation of everything that's happening, uh, happening in your life. So all of those things have an effect on you and so does the arthritis. So you have to accept the changes have occurred and will continue to occur, especially with arthritis, which is not a, a something that happens to you once, but it's a progressive condition that will change uh, over your lifespan. And you have to accept that you have to keep adjusting to it. It's not like you do something once and it's a fix forever. Accept that the libido and function may be affected. And then focus on supplementing for the losses, for compensating for the changes, rather than accepting that those are losses that are stable and are gone forever. So you're working from what you can change, what you do have, what you do enjoy, rather than focusing on what you have lost 
and becoming very unhappy about that. You want to have the best possible outcome for what is possible. There's no point having dreams about something that is totally impossible. The other thing, and VJ alluded to this, is focus on yourself and your partner, not on others. It really doesn't matter that your next door neighbor swings from chandeliers for two hours twice a week. That's irrelevant. It doesn't matter what somebody else can do or they can enjoy. Focus in on yourself and your partner and not on others and not on media representations. Once again, BJ alluded to this. You know, social media, movies, books, that's adult theater. It's not reality. And if you make that your goal for happiness, chances are you're going to be rather unhappy. You know, VJ said, why do we have sex? You know, why is sex important? Why are we having, doing this talk? Well, sex is, in, in our understanding, it's not just about libido or lust. When we make love, we give and receive love. We give and receive affection and acceptance. They, all those self-esteem needs that tell us that we are important, we're important to somebody. And I've highlighted skin hunger needs, which I think are critically important for human beings. All mammals need to be touched. And if you think about it as an adult, when do we get naked full body touch? Really only during lovemaking. So if you stop lovemaking, how do you meet your skin hunger needs? And if you've got losses in your life and you've got pain and you've got disability, you need to have your skin hunger needs met even more than someone who isn't sick. Because when you're touched, you feel better. When a child falls down and the mum gives a hug and a kiss, doesn't that make the pain of the child better? The same thing happens for adults. So when we held in the act of making love, our skin hunger needs get met and our mental wellness is better gender validation. You, all of you are here for the recreational sexuality, not the procreational. So we're talking about what I call unnatural sex, recreational sex. We want to have fun. It relieves boredom. boredom. It lowers tension. It, it's a good treatment for insomnia. But the main thing is to have fun by yourself or with someone else. And it has those health benefits that I mentioned. It lowers blood pressure. We think it improves immunity. And it certainly lowers pain. So there are a lot of reasons for making love. And I call sexuality that meta-communication tool because it addresses all of those things, often without words. And words are hard for us, uh, especially people from an Anglo-Saxon background aren't very good about talking about love, intimacy, and desire. Very importantly, we also know that most couples who stop making love have a decrease in all those really lovely positive things, verbal affection, physical affection, goodwill in the relationship, humor and fun. Now, once again, I think those are critically important things for anyone who's, who's suffered any kind of loss or disability, loss of function. We need those things for wellness. And really, the only reason to live longer is to live well. Who wants to live long miserably? It happens when we lose sexual function, especially if it's been good sexual function. Well, most of us are very unhappy because we're not prepared for changes. When we first learn about sexuality in our teens, the expectation is that that level of sexual function and that level of desire and horniness and enjoyment and sensitivity will last for a whole lifetime. No one ever talks to us about what happens with life changes and with aging. So very few of us are prepared for those changes. Very few of us handle loss as well. And almost none of us have had the good sexual education to cope with these things and the emotional resilience to accept losses easily. And with education, most of us don't know what to do about it. 
because it's not the talk we had with our mum and dad. I'm going to segue. I'm going to do a lot of segueing because I haven't got a lot of time to de develop each concept. So sexuality, following on from BJ, is a journey for me. And it starts with yourself, your self-sensuality. Now, just thinking about it, how many of you have given yourself the gift to yourself of something sensual today? Brushing your hair, did you stop to think about what you're doing and how it felt? Did you put lipstick on yourself so that you felt more feminine? Did you put on a nice pair of perhaps boxer underpants to feel your penis, to feel that you're connected to your male body? When you're having a shower, did you slow down and feel the water running over your chest? None of these things take a long time. But to a large extent, most of us disconnect from that sensuality and we become like walking heads, you know, like that TV screen with the face in it and, and nobody. And we forget about the daily ongoing sensuality of being mammals. You can't give something you don't have. So you can't frog leap from beginning of this journey to intercourse without the, that continuity, that passage from one event to the other. And the next becomes that self-sexuality. I think boys have an easier time than girls in this arena because the penis being external, most boys will hold their penis every day, enjoy it, know it intimately. Very few women walk around touching their clitoris on a daily basis. So it's that kind of dis disconnection that women often have. And I spend a lot of time talking to women about, you know, enjoying that, connecting with that. Um, touch your breasts when you're having a shower. Say hello to your pubic area uh, in the morning when you wake up, the same way as men do. Be connected with yourself as a sexual person. You don't need somebody else who have a really wonderful sex, uh, self-sexuality. And then it's that you go on to partner sensuality. And what is partner sensuality? You know, I love it. If I see a couple in the supermarket and he's put his arm around her waist and given her a little squeeze, she looks at him in the eye and has a little giggle. That's partner sensuality. It's connecting with each other on that level in a, 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 at a time when there is no scope for sex, unless you want to be arrested. Okay, so that's that kind of flirting, enjoying, mind sex, connection with that other person that ongoing can happen at any time. You can play tootsies in, in the restaurant. You know, it's about... Uh, caressing each other while you're at the, you know, uh, watching TV or holding hands at the movies, all of that, it's connection with this one person. And then it makes sense to segue into partner sexuality. And as Vijay has said, out course is for recreation. So much more variety occurs with outer course than does with intercourse. You know, you can be, you can read the Kama Sutra, you can hire a couple of sex assistants to hold you in position so you, you can manage all the positions in the book. But, you know, it comes out, the outcome of a penis in a vagina is penis in vagina. But without a course, with oral sex, with manual stimulation, with parallel masturbation, with all the toys that are available, you can have infinite variety. And out of course is wonderful for people who have a limitation or a disability or have pain because it's much more open to, you know, uh, changing and compensating for things. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But think about this continuity. If you don't have your own sex sexuality, uh, self-sexuality, you're not going to be able to give yourself generously to a partner and you're not going to be able to understand yourself to teach your partner what you need. And at times of change, like with a disability or an illness or pain, you need to reconnect with yourself 
to find out what has changed and what you need to do to compensate for that change. You can't expect somebody else to understand you better than you understand yourself. You have to explore that first. So for me, outer course is very much for recreation. Intercourse is most relevant from nature's point of view for procreation. And don't forget, we're having unnatural sex. Nature wants us to be focused on having intercourse because it wants us to reproduce and for the species to survive. But we're beyond that, you know, and we want to have fun. So as you're thinking about it, well, okay, Dr. Margaret says all these things, how do I start improving my sexual life? Well, first of all, think about what was your sexual function like before the diagnosis of arthritis? And that becomes kind of a, a baseline to work from because the arthritis and the pain may not be the cause or the total cause of the sexual difficulty. Quite often, and especially if the arthritis is of later onset, there's been a gradual decline in your sexual function. It's been less good, less, less enjoyable, and you've not really noticed until some other crisis comes along and suddenly, you know, you're paying attention to it. So have a think about, you know, were you really having a good sex life? Were you really enjoying it? Was the sexual script, and that's what I call what you do within making love, uh, what you wanted? Was that satisfying for you? So you've got a new understanding of what your sexuality is about and perhaps what you want and what was missing before. So that's a starting point for compensating and replacing. It's very important to be proactive on your own behalf. Uh, if you can't, you know, talk to your friend, your partner or your GP, then find someone you can talk to. Don't accept the limitation. There are so many losses that each of us have in our life that can't necessarily be easily fixed. Sexuality is something that can always be improved. And remember to in Include your partner in the journey. If you have two people in a stable relationship and one goes off to gain a whole lot of skills and needs and wants, and the other person's not taken on the journey, then it can separate you. But if you go on the journey together, it's actually a very intimate experience and a very bonding experience because when you can fix your sex life and make it better together, you can take on the world. Because that's hard and you've opened each, uh, yourselves up to the other person and you've shared it and the gain is there between the two of you. So it's actually a very powerful um, journey to go on to be intimate. So BJ introduced this uh, concept and you know it's, it's about how does our brain know that we're to be sexual? So there are two components, the body, and the mind. And as Vijay says, the, the brain is the biggest sex organ. Now, the body, here I'm talking about <clears throat> all our senses, the five senses. So it's touch, smell, taste, um, uh, proprioception. The five senses are really important. And think about how are you engaging those five senses in order to get into the mood, in order to become aroused, in order to reach that threshold for orgasm. And your mind, where is your mind? What's it doing? So yes, it's possible to put a clamp a vibrator onto your clitoris um, and think of putting out the garbage and you may have an orgasm. And from the mental point of view, just think about it's possible for uh, say a man to be with the woman of his dreams and she's doing the things he's always dreamt about and suddenly into his mind pops the idea, oh, last time I lost my erection. What's gonna to happen to his erection? He's got all the perfect environment there, but his mind has taken over and he's got to lose that erection. So you really have to work together as much as you can, but remember that the mind is the most powerful sex organ we have. And what you need to create that erotica for your mind 
to be on this journey. And that's the daily sensuality, the partner sensuality, the partner sexuality. And then as I'll talk in a minute about the, the toys and the aids and the medications that you can have. So I've chosen one sexual difficulty, which is libido or desire as this is the most common thing that I see. And it's the most common problem that people with any kind of pain or disability condition will present with. Uh, because <laughs> pain is not a great aphrodisiac. Tiredness is not a great aphrodisiac. Nature doesn't want us to be sexual when the conditions are suboptimal because it doesn't want us to reproduce in those kind of conditions. So it's normal to have a decline or a loss of sexual desire when your conditions aren't good. It may not, oops, it may not be an issue if you're single, but it can be a significant issue in a relationship where your partner is not uh, experiencing the pain or the disability. And you know, be kind to yourself because it is actually one of the more difficult sexual issues to manage and resolve because it is so multifactorial. There's so many factors and individual factors that are involved that, um, you know, it's often very difficult to resolve by yourself. So you need that third impartial person who's not emotionally involved, who can perhaps, uh, perhaps see the big picture of what's happening. Now, the age of onset of arthritis may, may uh, create specific issues for individuals. And I don't know if there are any young people watching this presentation, but young people with any chronic condition or disability often get infantilized. So that protection means they perhaps aren't able to socialize uh, in the way that other children do. They kind of protect it from, from harm and learning and you know, somehow sexuality is deemed as a dangerous thing, uh, discouraged from experimenting and so on, and often given limited sexual education. So, you know, to be aware of that because you don't need more losses in your life. And I talk a lot about masturbation. Uh, I haven't had an opportunity to fit it into this uh, presentation. Now, so I've just stuck it here as the importance of young for young people to be taught about good masturbation and the importance of adults who, uh, especially in a relationship who may be experiencing uh, different conditions of including masturbation into the relationship and of people with a, a disability, especially something that's tiring or mobility limiting to embrace masturbation because it gives you so much more flexibility to be able to uh, attain that sexual pleasure, which intercourse and partner sex may not give you. So masturbation is a wonderful thing to, to think about and to include in your life. Uh, Middle-aged people, uh, often, you know, if you've had a good sex life, then it's something that both of you are losing that you valued. Uh, you may still have desire for your partner and for sexual activity, even though it's difficult to, to have the act. And you, you may be conscious that your partner still has needs and expectations and feel bad that you're not able to meet those, those needs and expectations. Talking is so important. Good communication so that you're both on the same page is critically important. Older individuals have a different set, possibly a different set. They may have more comorbid states. Uh, sexuality may have eased into more affectionate and sensual behavior rather than intercourse and pen trip sexuality. Uh, and often there may be a loss of a partner at that stage. So you really, uh, and if it's an individual that's grown up that masturbation is bad and, and you shouldn't masturbate, then losing a partner can have significant impact there. So, you know, just the age of the individual may have a slight difference in conditions. So going on to specific things, pain, fatigue, and movement uh, restriction. So the positions of lovemaking are very, very important. You know, the most common position that we use in Australia is the missionary position. 
And this is possibly the absolute worst position for people to make love in. You know, uh, the man to support himself on his arms, to perhaps support himself on his knees or, he, he, you know, his ankles, um, all of that, that strength that's required and then the thrusting on top of that, um, you know, can be very difficult with arthritis. And for the woman, if, if she's got, if her hips are affected, that kind of the pressure and the, the thrusting of separate, opening her legs up and, and having that thrusting, uh, on her pelvis can be very, very uncomfortable. So it's very important to explore other positions. And also perhaps, you know, thinking about who's been the more active one in the lovemaking till the arthritis set in. And perhaps there needs to be a change in that and not to see that it's a negative thing, that you're not able to do something, but to see it as an opening up and an opportunity to explore more things. Uh, the comorbid conditions, especially depression, would be very common here. And the medication for depression, what happens with that, how that affects libido, um, needs to be considered as well. The social changes that occur, the self-esteem, if you've had a loss of perhaps the work that you're doing or the role in the community that you've been doing on in the family, how that affects sexuality um, and especially initiating uh, in sexuality for a man and so psychological decisions, uh, issues, so dependency or burden fears or fear of being uh, rejected by the partner because you're, you're now a different person. So talking these things through, exploring them, seeing if what's going on in your head is actually what's going on in your partner's head. Not projecting and assuming that because you're afraid, your partner's afraid, talking and sharing. So communication is very, very important. Now, I've been talking about uh, sexuality as if it's important for everyone, and it's not. It still falls on a bell curve where there are many people in our uh, society who are just not interested in sex, it's never been terribly good for them. They've never been terribly sexually driven. And the fact that it, it, you know, there's now a good reason for it to stop is just a positive thing. So to be sensitive about that. And, but if you're in a relationship, to realize that it has to be, it's an issue that needs to be negotiated because your partner is not experiencing the same thing as you are. On the other hand, your partner may be worried, is it safe to be sexual with you, given that you're going through this experience, that given that you're in pain during lovemaking? You know, is it fair of them to continue to want to have sex with you? These things have to be talked about. So the management. The most important thing is to have that detailed understanding of yourself. What do you know? What do you not know? What has been good? What hasn't been good? What worked for you and your partner? What do you want? What would you like to explore? What have you read in a book that you'd like to try? This will give you a direction for therapy. This is where it's customized for you, for who you are and what you know and what you're experienced. Start with the easiest. And as you build up confidence, it'll give you that motivation, encouragement to try perhaps more scary things. Should something scary or anxiety be provoking not be tried? Absolutely not. Anxiety is your friend. It's just telling you that you're doing something new or different or perhaps pay attention. Anxiety or fear are not reasons to stop. If you're not feeling anxious or afraid, you're stuck. You're not doing anything. So accept that you're going to be anxious, that you're going to be a little bit afraid, and I encourage you to be brave. Start with the easiest, but that's not always what has to happen. Sometimes you have to start with the most destructive. So if there is domestic violence, if you have fear for your safety in some way, you have to start there. You cannot have good sex in a lousy relationship. That's just not possible. If you're afraid, if you're, you know, you're uh, 
concept of making love is pain for yourself, that's not going to work. So maybe you have to, you know, start at either end. Think about the negatives and positive uh, negatives and the stressors that are in your life, and remove and modify those things. So sexual script is actually what you do in lovemaking. And for most people, this is very difficult to think about. You know, I, I ask my patients when, when they come in, and for instance, oh, tell me how you masturbate. And they go, <laughs> how can I talk about it? Like, you know, like everybody else, like normal. And I say, there's no such thing as normal. We all do it differently. Uh, and it's thinking about who does what to whom, for how long, in what position, who, who makes the decisions to change the activity you're doing. You know, what isn't working for you with, with, with that? And to find the words to share that with your partner. There's no room for coyness, shyness, or embarrassment. If you're not going to address this issue now, when are you going to address it? Okay. Do you want the next 10, 20, 30 years of your life to be suboptimal? So you have to increase the motivation to be sexual. You know, the, the willingness to be sexual. It has, there has to be some sense of why you want to do this. And that comes back to that partner sensuality, the flirting, the fun, the, the sense that you expect to have a good time uh, with a person who treats you with respect, who treats you with love, and whom you actually want to touch, that you want to touch your partner's skin, you want to kiss them, you want to be with them, you will also want to give them pleasure. So you have to think about doing things that increase that. And the best way to do that is to have fun together in non-sexual arena. When was the last time you went for coffee together and flirted? When was the last time you sat on a bench uh, over a, a park or, you know, at the ocean and just enjoyed being together? You know, it's, when was the last time you you know, perhaps did a puzzle together that was difficult and got the satisfaction of doing it together. It's the motivation to be sexual comes from the motivation of doing other things. Decrease the inhibitors. What would be a common inhibitor would be being angry and resentful at your partner because they haven't done things. Now, I have to tell men especially that Unloading the dishwasher will not give you sex. It's not that equal relationship. But un unpacking the dishwasher will help in the willingness of your partner to be open to being sexual. So you still have to do sexual specific things, which is increasing the aphrodisiacs. Yeah? And the aphrodisiac may be the, you brushed your teeth and combed your hair before you got into bed. It may be that you've uh, gone out and bought some nice aromatherapy oil to put into a candle. It may be that you, you know, took your partner for a walk and flirted and then came home and gently took their clothes off, telling them how beautiful they are for you. You have to increase the aphrodisiacs, which are going to stimulate the mind, which are going to prepare the body then. For the act of making love. You know, VJ talked about the ingredients. So if you talk about making love as the cake, you can't bake a cake if you don't have flour, sugar, milk, eggs. And the aphrodisiacs and the having fun are part of the, the equation. Very importantly, develop the habit of being sexual. Just think about it. If I asked each of you to sit in a chair for a week and then get up, what would you be like? You couldn't do it. You'd be stiff. Now think about the last time you made love. We put our sexual apparatus, a very complex apparatus of, of nerves and blood vessels and muscles connected to the brain on the shelf for a month. And then you take it off the shelf and you expect it to work perfectly. Now, don't feel bad about yourself because that's normal human behavior. When we are bad at something, if we're scared of something, if we're disappointed in something, we tend to do it less. Unfortunately, if we, the less we have sex, 
the worse we become at it. You can't become better at something by doing it less often. So we kind of shoot ourselves in the foot with this normal behavior. The best thing that people can do to maintain good sexual function is to continue being sexual regularly to different degrees. I'm not saying about, you know, intercourse um, for a, a, an hour every day. It's about the vagina being exercised. It's about the penis being exercised by having blood flow come to it, getting the erection. And that's all you have to do with it. It's about the vagina being stretched so that the pliability is maintained and the blood vessels improve uh, and you have easier lubrication. It's, you have to be sexual to some degree. That regularity helps maintain comfortableness and keeps the apparatus workable. If you, if you let it get rusty, it won't serve you very well. So it's very important also to do pelvic floor exercise for both men and women. Women tend to stop doing it once they leave the hospital after, you know, the maternity hospital or a couple of months later on, or until they're told that they've got urinary incontinence and have to do it. It's cheap. It's free, in fact. It's painless. It can be done anytime. It helps you become more easily orgasmic. It helps you have better orgasms. It can even help you become multi-orgasmic. It can help, we think, men to, with penile venous leaks. It's good for both sexes. Get into the habit of doing it every day. If you drive a car, every red light, if you watch a lot of TV, every commercial break that comes on, and whatever it is that you're doing regularly, do it. Talk to your partner about doing it. Both of you do it. It's very, very helpful. Stop being coitocentric. I'm segueing again. Stop being coitocentric. As Vijay said, the penis and vagina is fantastic for reproduction. It's not the best way for recreation. And especially for someone who's got a pain or a, a disability of some kind or liability, mind sex is fantastic. Think about when you were young and you were courting. Didn't you enjoy the flirting and the innuendo and the compliments that was going on? When was the last time as a middle-aged person you did this? So my outer course, all that variety. And outer course can be uh, masturbation with your partner holding you. It can be parallel masturbation where you're lying in bed together, both in the most comfortable position you can be in, both masturbating to orgasm. It can be using toys on one partner. You both don't have to be sexual on the same occasion. You can take turns with that. And working out what works best for each of you and as a couple to give you pleasure. And then intercourse. I'm not saying intercourse is bad. It's a wonderful activity. But maybe you need to explore side-to-side -side positions or props, as I'll show you some pictures, to be in a different position. Minimal participation sex is wonderful. Having, making love to the level that you've got energy. But the important stipulation here is let your partner know about this. Because if you just say, yes, I'll make love with you tonight, your partner expects making love to mean what he's got in mind or she's got in mind. Okay? It's better to under-promise and over-deliver than the other way around. Tell your partner, I'd love to make love, to, but I've only got energy for holding you while you masturbate. And you might find that as, as you're relaxed and no demands are being, you've got the energy to actually reach over and masturbate him. Isn't that going to give him more satisfaction than if you said yes, he expected to have full intercourse and you were just too tired and gave up halfway? So under promise over to deliver, and that's what minimal participation sex is. Function to the level that you can. Accept medications, you know, for men, that's the PD-5s. For women, it could be hormone replacement therapy of some kind. Some women benefit for, from PD-5s as well. Could be a medication change. Your antidepressant might be changed to another one. Using the supports, I'll show you some pictures. Include toys and erotica into 
your sexual script. Now, people say that's not natural. You're having recreational sex anyway. It's not natural sex. I mean, if you're a tennis player, don't you want a new tennis racket sometimes? We thrive on variety and doing things. It's about expanding zones and having variety. Generally, so keep fit, keep active mentally and physically, do fun things and aphrodisiacs, have open, uh, honest communication about the sex you want. Plan ahead. Spontaneity is grossly, grossly overrated. What does it mean? You're walking down the street, you see uh, uh, you know, someone who's sexually attractive for you and you jump their bones? That's not, that's not going to work very well for you. If you have any liability at all, you do need to plan. And with arthritis, it's about planning when you take your pain meds, a warm bath or a massage, definitely not last thing at night. Um, and each day will be different, so be flexible. And, you know, I talked about positions. Lubricants, best friend for everybody. But there are such beautiful toys around. Don't be shy about exploring them. Go to one of the nicer sex shops, touch them, feel them, see what, what you could be comfortable with. Try with things that don't threaten you and see what the response can be. Make it something fun between the two of you. The two of you are a little bit anxious, the two of you are exploring together and the two of you will climb the mountain together. And then of course, there are different props and supports that you may need. So talk to your physiotherapist about this, get that advice. So key points, things have changed, accept and move on. You know, being resentful, being angry is not going to gain you anything. Don't expect to have good sex in a poor relationship. Change horniness to willingness. Broaden the definition of good sex from intercourse to making love. Lubricant and vibrator, your best friend. And most of all, if you can't have the whole pie, enjoy the bit that you have. It's certainly better than nothing. And good sexuality is an important part for many people's lives. You don't have to lose it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Margaret. I have, I know I for a fact have learnt a lot and, you know, sex is such an important part of identity and uh, I think something that we often see with people living with arthritis is that they struggle with identity and what you've highlighted to us today is um, just how much there is to unpack but also how many solutions are actually out there. It's just being brave, stepping up, finding, um, seeking out the help that they need. Thank you so much for that. Does anyone have questions? What I might do is I might switch off the recording to make it a bit more of a private, open, safe space for everyone.